In this video, I want to bring you some clips from a recent video that I saw on YouTube um, for Andrew Huberman, where he was interviewing Dr. Stacey Sims, who I've read both of her books, War and Next Level. They're amazing if you are a woman that works out, um, that has been an athlete and just struggling with their body, or even if you haven't worked out, they're just amazing books. But anyway, he interviews her and there's a lot of really helpful information, but it's an over two and a half hour interview. So I took snippets of it that I thought would be really helpful for my clients or for women over 40 that are struggling with their bodies just some really helpful information that's really backed by science. Men age more in a linear fashion, whereas women, we have a definitive point in our late 40s, early 50s, where all of a sudden things go to shit, where it's that perimenopausal state. And I can't tell you how many emails and DMs I get in a day from women who are like, I'm 46 or I'm 47, I'm putting on body fat, I don't know what's going on, I can't sleep. And then we say it's perimenopause, they're like, what is that? And so when we're looking at perimenopause, it is a huge change in the body because you're having less and less of your sex hormones circulating. More and more anovulatory cycles means no progesterone or very low progesterone. You're having a difference in the pulse of your estradiol to those flat line aspects. And because every system in the body is affected by it, this is why you see more soft tissue injuries, like two of the biggest things that women who are in their 40s are going to PTs about are frozen shoulder and plantar fascia. So those are two really indicative issues that are happening in perimenopause. So that whole section of mid to mid 40s to early 50s is a definitive aging point where I really tried to get women to get into the heavy lifting and get into the patterns of polarizing their training, not putting an emphasis on zone two, just really looking at how am I polarizing, how am I affecting my central nervous system so that when they get into that one point in time of that perimenopause, their body is already conditioned for the stress that's coming. The most common question I get as it relates to males versus females is, is intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding, as it's sometimes called, an eight-hour feeding window, a six-hour feeding window, a 10-hour feeding window, is that something that perhaps differs in terms of its impact and how well it works for men versus women? Yeah, that's a short answer. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll put some parameters around it, right? So if we talk about intermittent fasting, that's where you have like the 20-hour non-feeding window or you're holding a fast until noon or after. Um, and then we have time-restricted eating, and that's the fancy way of saying normal eating, where you're having breakfast, and then you stop eating after, or you don't have anything after dinner, right? So you're eating with your circadian rhythm during the day. If we look at intermittent fasting, where you're holding the fast up till noon, or you're having days of really low calorie restriction, we see in active women, it's very detrimental, unless you have PCOS or you have some other subclinical issue. And the reason for that is we, as women, have more oxidative fibers. So we hear about all the things about fasting to, be, to improve our metabolic flexibility, to improve telomere length, to improve parasympathetic activation. But by the nature of women having more oxidative fibers, we are already metabolically more flexible than men. We Interesting. Have, yeah. I didn't know that. Um, could you elaborate on more oxidative fibers, what that is, and yeah. how, how it relates to metabolic flexibility? Sure, sure. Yeah. So oxidative fibers are, are muscle fibers that are more aerobic capacity. So those are the ones that you, know, you can go long and slow for very long period of time because it uses a lot of free fatty acids. You need a little bit of glucose in order to activate those free fatty acids. So when we look when a woman starts to exercise, she goes through blood glucose first and then gets into free fatty acid use. She doesn't tap so much into liver muscle glycogen, which is I think another misconception that happens. So when we're talking about fasting or fasted workouts, trying to improve that metabolic flexibility, it increases stress on the woman. And so when we're talking about overall stress, we're talking about cortisol increase and they can't hit intensities high enough with no fuel to be able to invoke the post-exercise responses of growth hormone and testosterone, which then drop cortisol. So from an overall stress perspective, that fasted workout and holding that fast for a long period of time increases cortisol. But then when we look from like a hypothalamic point of view, and we're looking at how the brain reads it, so we know that there's one area of kisspeptin neurons in the brain for men, but there are two for women. So the two areas are distinct where one controls appetite and luteinizing hormone, and the other one is looking at estrogen and thyroid. So if you start having an exercise stress or a daily stress of getting up and going on with your day without fuel, you perturb those kisspeptin neurons and down regulate them. So when you start down regulating them, we see that after four days, you have a, a dysregulation of thyroid. We have a change in our luteinizing hormone pulse, which is really important to maintain endocrine function. And we'll hear this, oh, I've been fasting for so many years and it does great for me. But the other side of the question is, well, how much better would you be if you were to actually pay attention to your circadian rhythm and fuel according to the stress at hand and knowing that you're going to garner less stress that way? And if we're really tying in nutrition according to that profile instead of following a fast, we see better brain improvements as well. We see more cognitive function. We see less thyroid dysfunction. And overall, a woman does much better when we're not in that fast state.
Then when you look at population research that's coming out now, they're showing in both men and women who hold their fast till noon and then have an eating window from noon to maybe 6 p.m. have more obesogenic outcomes than people who break their fast at 8 and finished their eating window by 4 or 5 p.m. So it's coming back to the chronobiology of we need to eat when our body is under stress and needs it unless we have a specific issue like obesity, inactivity, PCOS, or other metabolic conditions, then we can look at using fasting as a strategic intervention to help with those modalities. The longer someone withholds food after exercise and the greater they stay in that catabolic or breakdown state, the more the brain perceives it as being in a low energy state. So the first thing to go is lean mass. When you start telling a woman that, you know, if you're going to do fasted training and, and or you're going to delay food intake afterwards, why are you training? Because the first thing that goes is lean mass and it's really, really hard for women to put on lean mass. So once you start really nailing that and then saying, look, you just need 15 grams of protein to really help and be able to conserve that lean mass. It's a small, simple fix. People try it and they're like, oh my gosh, I feel amazing. So Steve Smith Ryan out of UNC did some specific work looking at carbohydrate, protein before and you know, strength or cardio and found that if you're going to do a true strength training session, you only need around 15 grams of protein before you go to really help you get into the idea that yes, you have some fuel on board and also increases your post-exercise oxygen consumption or your EPOC. So your resting metabolism stays elevated, um, giving you a better chance for recovery post-exercise as well. If you're going to do any kind of cardiovascular type work up to an hour, then you're adding 30 grams of carb to that. So it's not a lot of food. And it's not a full meal. Women who are in the reproductive years need around 35 grams of good protein, high quality leucine oriented protein within 45 minutes. And we see that women who are perimenopausal onwards are 40 to 60 grams because we become more anabolically resistant to food and exercise as we get older. Um, when we look at like the recovery window for food, there are definitely sex differences because we hear all the conversation of there's no recovery window. It's, you know, it, it's old science. But we look at the research of when women's metabolisms come back down to baseline, meaning that they have constant straight blood sugar levels versus men. Women, it's within uh, 60 minutes. And for men, it's up to three hours. So when we're looking at the data that says there's no window, per se, for getting food in, it's based on male data. So when we're looking at women, women we have this tighter window to stop that breakdown effect and start the reparation. Um, so yeah, it's like when we're talking about the protein intake, it's really important, not only to get that leucine content up in the muscle to start the reparation and repair, but also again, to signal that, yeah, we're in a building state. We're not holding that catabolic state and increasing all the repercussions that come with it. So women should try and get 30 or as much as 40, maybe 50 grams of protein, depending on their age, mm -hmm. post-training within an hour of training. I get into talking about cardio and specifically classes like orange theory classes. And a lot of my clients take things like this and wonder why their body composition isn't changing. So this is really interesting information. There seems to always be this risk of overtraining. Mm -hmm. And as you pointed out, for various reasons, cultural reasons, historical reasons, um, around exercise, I my observation is that most women sort of, unless they know better, default to cardiovascular exercise as opposed to resistance training. Yeah. So if a woman in her 40s late thirties to let's say 50 is doing two to four sessions of resistance training workouts per week. And they also really like cardio or they feel they want to, or should do cardio. Should they be careful about how much cardio they're doing? And is there a best form of cardio? Should they really emphasize the high intensity interval training? Should they avoid zone two? We should probably also define for people what zone two is if, yeah. they, if they don't already know. Um, so I am notorious for slamming things like Orange Theory and F45 because they market specifically to that age group of women and it's not appropriate because it's not true high intensity work. When we're looking at women who are really trying to maximize body composition change and longevity and unfortunately default to cardio because they think, oh, that's going to help change my body composition. It's going to help me lose body fat. It doesn't. Is this things like Soul Cycle as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've never done any of these, yeah. um, but I imagine there's a lot of spinning, a lot of moving, a lot of sweating, and a lot of quote unquote calories burned emphasis. Yes, there is. But it's it puts women squarely in moderate intensity where they're so used to leaving one of those classes feeling absolutely smashed that when you tell them, actually that training doesn't work for you because it's putting you in a state of intensity that drives cortisol up, but it's not a strong enough stress to invoke the post-exercise growth hormone and testosterone responses that we want to dampen that cortisol. So this is why we have that hyperbole of women who are in their 40s plus shouldn't do high intensity work. It's like, well, actually they shouldn't do moderate intensity. They need to avoid that polarizing, absolutely. That's what we want. We want true high intensity work, which is one to four minutes of 80% or more or if you're doing sprint interval, it's full gas for 30 seconds or less. And you're doing that a couple of times a week, 
You're not doing it every day because you need to have enough recovery to hit those intensities truly, because those are the intensities that are going to give you those post-exercise hormonal responses to drop cortisol. When we're looking at women who are like, oh, well, I love going out for hours and hours on my bike and I love, you know, doing my spin classes. It's like, okay, but we need to look at the big rock here. If you are looking for longevity and body composition change and cognition and all those things, you have to polarize your training and that has to be the focus. But soul food, like I come from a long background of endurance. I now love riding my gravel bike on the weekends for long periods of time, which is not optimal for me, my age, that kind of stuff for all the things that I want to see improvements in. But mentally, it's great. So we talk about going out for that long stuff. Zone two is that low conversation, and that's fine for mental health and being out in nature. But for optimal health and well-being, we don't want to do that. We want to look at resistance training as a bedrock and true high intensity work to help with body composition change, metabolic control, insulin sensitivity, brain health, and dropping that cortisol. Now we're going to talk about specifically age and how she suggests that you do training if you really want body composition changes. If you're in your 40s, you've never done resistance training at all, then we take between mm, two weeks to four months to really learn how to move well because there's a higher incidence of soft tissue injury and overall injury as we get into our 40s because of perturbations of estrogen. And ideally, when we get there, we're looking at that around three, minimum three resistance training with compound movements and either one sprint interval or two sprint intervals in one hit in a week. And just to remind people, compound movements, multi-joint movements, squats, deadlifts, uh, chin-ups, rows, overhead presses, bench presses, et cetera, as opposed to isolation movements where only one joint is, yeah. is moving. Yeah. Yeah. And for everybody in all those age ranges that you describe, are you suggesting they train the same muscle groups three or four times per week, or they do some sort of split where it's upper body, lower body, take a day off, or upper body, take a day off, lower body, take a day off, whatever that what might work for them? Yeah, what works for them. It so that's it. That's a lot of information, and it's very science-y, but I wanted to just give you some science-backed information on, you know, if you are struggling, maybe these things can help you. I'll link the whole video down below. It is two and a half hours, and she does get into more specifics about training if you still get your menstrual cycle and ways that you can work around that. But I really wanted to focus this on, you know, women that are really, you know, 45 and up and struggling with their body composition and things that they can maybe do to circumvent that and help and look at their workouts in a different way. It's why I created From Over 40. This is like what I really am passionate about is you know, being as healthy as I can long-term and what are the ways I can do that with the latest information specifically on studies that are done on women. So I hope you like this information and like and subscribe if you want more videos like this. I'll see you in the next one.